Hello, my name is Richard Albert. Welcome to the latest installment of our video interview series here at iConnect. My guest today is Nick Robinson, fellow at the Center on the Legal Profession at Harvard Law School. And today Nick is joining us to talk about judicial appointments in India. Nick, hi. Thanks so much for your time today. Thanks for having me. So Nick, there are a lot of very exciting things happening right now in India with respect to constitutional change, specifically formal amendment of the Indian Constitution. Tell us about the latest amendment that has been all but ratified uh, concerning the judicial appointment scheme in India. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the latest amendment is the 121st Amendment to the Indian Constitution that's going to set up a national um, judicial appointments commission for the country that will appoint uh, Supreme Court judges and uh, appoint and transfer High Court judges. Um, so the, the way it works in India uh, is that um, to amend the Constitution in regards uh, to the judiciary, um, the amendment needs to be approved by two-thirds of both houses of parliament, so the Lok Sabha and the Raj Sabha. Um, then once it's approved by a supermajority of both uh, houses of parliament, it also has to be approved by half of the states. Um, so this amendment um, was approved by both houses of parliament back in August um, and is in, uh, we just had 16 of the 29 states um, approve um, the amendment as well, so it will be, um, the president just has to give uh, their assent and it will become a formal part of the Constitution probably starting early next year. So this amendment will constitutionalize the National Judicial Appointments Commission, which suggests that this will create a new way of appointments to the judiciary in India. Before we talk about the new method of appointment, could you tell us about the old method? How have judges been appointed uh, to the judiciary in the past? Um, sure. So the uh, Indian Constitution says uh, that uh, judges will be appointed uh, by the president after consulting the chief justice um, and whatever members of the Supreme Court the president deems necessary. However, this has been uh, re this clause of the Constitution has been reinterpreted uh, by the Supreme Court, um, but in three cases in the 1980s and 1990s, which essentially gave the Supreme Court power uh, to appoint judges uh, to both the Supreme Court and the High Court themselves. So, in these three cases, which are called the three judges cases. Uh, they uh, said that a collegium of the Chief Justice of India, which is the senior most judge on the Indian Supreme Court, and the four other most uh, senior judges on the Supreme Court, so the five most senior judges, um, would select which judges would, uh, who select who would be appointed to the Supreme Court, um, and then essentially the president would just have to accept this. Um, for high court judges, it would be the Chief Justice of India, the two most other uh, senior Supreme Court judges, and <clears throat> the Chief Justice of the respective high court where a judge is being appointed to that high court or is being transferred to the high court. Um, this was done um, in the context of um, immediately after the emergency and a feeling that the government had been meddling too much in the internal affairs and politicizing the judiciary both in how, who was being appointed as judges and then even how judges were deciding cases. And so after the emergency when the government was um, and particularly the executive was largely discredited, um, the Supreme Court stepped in and said we're going to take over more control over who become Supreme Court and High Court judges. So there must have been some criticisms of that old system for there to have um, been a, a movement to amend the Constitution to constitutionalize this new National Judicial Appointments Commission. What were those criticisms? Yeah, so there's been criticisms almost um, from the beginning, but they've been come, become louder in recent years. So the, the chief criticisms are that this is undemocratic, um, it's unaccountable, it's essentially judges appointing themselves, um, that the system, in particular the collegium itself, had become incestuous and op opaque to both the public um, and to the other political branches. 
Um, so there had been criticism that good judges had been passed over and not elevated up to the Supreme Court or appointed um, to the high courts. Uh, there had been criticisms that mediocre judges um, had been um, appointed um, to the high court or up to the Supreme Court. Um, in India, uh, most of the uh, high court judges are either selected from the bar of that high court or they are, about a third of them, um, are promoted from the lower ranks of the judiciary. The Supreme Court itself mostly are judges that are promoted um, from the high court up to the Supreme Court. Um, or, and occasionally there'll be members of the bar appointed to the Supreme Court. And it runs principally on seniority so that um, the uh, the most senior judges of high courts um, are then appointed chief justices of those high courts. High court judges have to retire at 62. Uh, Supreme Court judges have to retire at 65. And so what would happen uh, is that uh, the most senior judges and the, uh, the chief justices of the high court would then become Supreme Court judges. Um, now, not all chief justices would necessarily um, become uh, of high courts would necessarily become Supreme Court judges, and this uh, created the space um, for the collegium to kind of pick favorites. Um, the reason, though, that there had been this seniority system was because there wasn't a view that there was that much uh, that, that we wanted to give less latitude to the collegium itself to 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 create legitimacy for it. Um, so this had also created the concern uh, that good judges who were younger. Um, were being passed over um, for the Supreme Court because we had this both opaque, unaccountable, and somewhat rigid system. Um, and so, so there was a feeling that this needed to change. I'm not uh, a fan of the distinction between process and substance, but it mm -hmm. sounds like there were both processual criticisms and also substantive criticisms. Yeah, that's right. I, I think that it, on the one hand it was viewed as undemocratic and unaccountable, unaccountable and that in the process itself the political branches weren't having their say. And then as the years have gone by, there was a concern that this uh, questionable process had been leading to questionable outcomes and you weren't getting as good judges as possible on both the Supreme Court and in the high courts. And so the criticism intensifies over the years. Um, reaches a boil, and now we have birthed before us the 121st Amendment to the Indian Constitution that constitutionalizes this National Judicial Appointments Commission. And so now, um, how will judges be appointed? Yeah, so um, uh, the, the commission um, is going to be a six-member body. So three of these members will come from the judiciary um, and three from elsewhere. So the, the three from the judiciary will be the Chief Justice of India and the two other most senior members of the Supreme Court. Uh, the other three members, one will be the, uh, the law minister and the other two will be eminent persons who are selected by uh, the prime minister uh, the leader of the opposition um, and the chief justice of India. So you'll have this this balance um, between uh, 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 half uh, uh, judicial members and half not judicial members, with at least one explicitly political member. And so, why now? Um, I understand that there has been criticism for a number of years, and so why couldn't the criticism just keep going? Uh, why pass the amendment now? What was it that convince political actors to say, okay, now now is the time for us to agree to do this, along with the states, to ratify the proposal sent to them by the parliament? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So there's, there's long been rumblings um, uh, about this collegium system, and there's been a number of studies who have uh, recommended creating some sort of commission that would act like the National Judicial Appointments Commission um, has been proposed to act. Um, but for many years, um, the, this just wasn't a political priority. Um, so the last government, in fact, the, the Congress-led uh, UPA uh, uh, coalition government that was in power up until earlier this year, um, had uh, tabled an amendment very much like the one that uh, passed in August. Um, but be uh, 
for the, the, this Congress government, um, particularly by the end of its term, it had become quite fractured. It wasn't a very strong um, coalition. And I think there was concern that there'd be this pushback from the judiciary as well, and maybe the government wouldn't be strong enough to take uh, this, this pushback, and, and it certainly wasn't a priority with everything else that was going on. Um, in June, there were elections in India, um, and the BJP came to power in a massive landslide. So although they only won about 31% of the vote, um, they got over half the seats in parliament. And this is the first time uh, that a party has had an absolute majority in terms of seats in parliament in India since 1984, so for about 30 years uh, when uh, Rajiv Gandhi came into power. Um, and early on in this government, they indicated that they wanted to have uh, more of a say in judicial appointments. So um, during the term of the last government, the Supreme Court Collegium had uh, recommended that uh, a prominent and well-respected lawyer uh, be appointed to the Supreme Court, but he had been Solicitor General in the last uh, Congress-led government. Um, the BJP uh, government, when it came into power, um, indicated that you know they couldn't uh, reject uh, the, the, this uh, 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 proposed member of the Supreme Court um, because they don't have that power um, under the, the, the case law that creates the collegium system, but they do have the power to just sit on the appointment and just say, we're not going to approve this person to sit on the Supreme Court. And after that, um, uh, the, uh, that individual withdrew their name. So there was already this indication that they wanted more of a say, and so in August, um, Parliament, with this new majority of the BJP, along with the Congress, who had uh, supported this um, even when they were in power but hadn't been able to pass it, um, passed this amendment. Um, and then the states um, have, uh, because the two major political parties, both the BJP and Congress, have been for this, have generally uh, been relatively quickly uh, passing this amendment as well. And as I, as I said earlier, we now have 16 of the 29 states bringing it um, over, over half. And so it passes uh, both houses of parliament. Now we have 16 of the 29 states uh, who have ratified the amendment. Are there any dissenting voices, however? Yeah, so the, there's been concern um, ever since this amendment was proposed, certainly in the Congress government, but even more so right when it was passed um, in August under the BJP government. Um, and the, the concerns primarily are about judicial independence, so that, that judges will not have um, a majority control on this, um, on this new uh, commission. Um, and in particular, although there's six members of the commission, um, if you have two members, two members can veto any appointment. Um, so you essentially need a 5-1 majority to get an appointment through, and there is, the, there is a concern um, that the political parties might use this to force through appointments that the judiciary otherwise um, would not think would be acceptable um, to be a judge. And so a number of prominent lawyers back in August uh, brought a public interest litigation case uh, to the Indian Supreme Court um, uh, saying uh, that uh, this uh, might violate the basic structure doctrine of uh, the Indian Constitution. And the court has actually, uh, I think, declined to hear that case on grounds that it is not yet right. Is that correct? Yeah, so that's correct. And so what I think is going to, or what I think what we can expect going forward out of this is that um, the, the, the case will almost certainly come back before the court. And since the Supreme Court back in August said, look, it's passed Parliament, hasn't passed the states yet, it's not an amendment yet, we don't want to hear this yet. Um, I think that the court will eventually hear this case. Um, I do think the court um, is wise in thinking that it doesn't want to hear the case right away. As I mentioned earlier, the BJP came into power in this landslide victory. They've been doing very well in state elections since then. Um, and so if the court is going to push back on um, the central government, it's probably going to wait a while, if it can, um, until there's a, a weaker government in the center, or at least some of that popularity of that electoral wave um, has come in. And, and it's unclear if it will 
um, strike down the, the uh, amendment as violating the basic structure of the Constitution. So what the basic structure essentially says um, is that the, the Supreme Court over about a 20, 30 year jurisprudence has said certain amendments to the Indian Constitution um, uh, if, uh, can be struck down if they violate uh, the basic structure of the Constitution. And this is a somewhat nebulous concept, um, but it includes things such as the democratic nature of the Indian Constitution, uh, secularism, federalism, and important in this case, uh, the independence of the judiciary. And so what the lawyers back in August had claimed was that this violates the independence of the judiciary because the judiciary doesn't have a majority say. Um, there's been some retired judges since who have also indicated that this might violate the basic structure. Um, so we'll have to wait and see whether the court um, tries to uh, 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 strike down the entire amendment, whether they read down the amendment or reinterpret it, or whether they wait for to see how the commission actually operates in, in practice and that if it allows a space, um, a prominent enough space for the judiciary that addresses their concerns, um, then um, it, it, it might let this uh, commission go forward in, in, in the, the way that um, it was designed um, in the amendment. So you are, uh, Nick, an expert in the structure of the Indian judiciary. In fact, you're writing a, uh, a chapter for forthcoming research handbook at Oxford on the Indian Constitution on India's judicial architecture. And so this subject of the National Judicial Appointments Commission fits very neatly into your research agenda. Yeah, no, that that's right. I've been watching this quite closely. So um, I've, as as you mentioned, I'm currently writing about the the structure of the Indian judiciary, particularly at this this top heavy nature of the uh, Indian judiciary, in which you have this almost supercharged Supreme Court and High Court, but um, both in terms of its power and in the kinds of the sheer number and types of cases they're taking on, uh, particularly in comparison to the, the lower judiciary, which isn't respected um, traditionally as much, not as many cases have gone to. I've also written a fair amount about the Indian Supreme Court, the types of cases uh, that it takes, um, the lawyers who argue before the Indian Supreme Court, so I've written a paper with Mark Galanter on what we call grand advocates, so these very prominent uh, lawyers uh, who argue before both the Supreme Court and the High Courts, and I've written about the, the panel structure of the Indian Supreme Court. So the Indian Supreme Court can have up to 31 judges, and they mostly sit in panels of, of two or three. And so what are the implications uh, of, of having these panels uh, of judges on the court's jurisprudence? So this question about where judges come from um, is very central um, to the types of type of work that I have been doing. And you have a very unique perspective into the judiciary, having clerked for the Chief Justice of India. That's right. Um, I After law school, I went and I clerked for the, the Chief Justice of the Indian Supreme Court, and I ended up spending seven years, mostly in India, but in South Asia more broadly, um, both uh, at a human rights litigation organization and then teaching in South Asia and being at, at, a, at a think tank in Delhi. So, Nick, you hold degrees from Chicago and Yale Law School. Where does your interest in the Indian Constitution come from? Um, yes, yeah, so... I, it, it's a really a, a lived interest in many ways. So when I, I went to India, I, I didn't plan on spending seven years there, but when I went and clerked for the Indian Supreme Court, um, you know, I discovered just how unique um, this institution is and, and how central it is to, to, to Indian political life. And so I realized that there's this uh, a, a whole new set of issues um, that constitutionalism raises in a society like India where um, you have such diversity, you have a country in transition um, in terms of uh, development, um, and such a, a large population that you're, you're trying to bring um, together in this, this great grand democratic experiment. Among the comparativists uh, that I speak with, uh, those who compare public law across borders, I, I very often like to ask a question that I'd love to ask you, and that is um, whether the Indian judiciary is the most powerful in the democratic world. I often hear scholars compare the Colombian 
constitutional court with the Indian Supreme Court, and they debate very intensely as to which one is is more powerful than the other. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, no. So you know, yeah, you and others are, are more experts on, on on the Colombian court than I am. I would just say a couple of things. I would I would say. Uh, the Indian court is quite powerful, certainly in the n sheer number of people it affects. Um, so, you know, India is about 1.2 billion people. Um, there's, you know, more people being governed by uh, the Indian Supreme Court than probably all the, uh, you know, English common law courts in, in the world combined. Um, and, you know, it's a court that um, has a far-reaching influence in Indian society. It's it's become a court very much that uh, helps govern the society in day to day, um, as well as as I've referenced to earlier, um, taking a critical role in terms of interpreting how the in in guarding the constitution, um, including from the. Uh, amendments that it, it fears will underplace its role um, and also uh, the democratic and secular role in India more broadly and it's become so powerful that it became a self-appointing institution so I don't know how that exactly stacks up with every other you know court in the world but I would say that certainly compared to courts in the United States and elsewhere um, it's it's carved out on a number of measures quite a bit of influence well, Nick, I have to say, the, the, I've read a lot of your work, and I want to recommend to our readers one paper in particular, which appeared last year in the American Journal of Comparative Law called Structure Matters, which is a comparison of the American and Indian uh, judicial structure. A great paper. I learned so much from it. Uh, and thank you for that, and also thank you for your time today. This has been really, really fascinating, and, uh, and we're grateful to you. Thank you, and, and thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Okay. Bye-bye, Nick. Bye.